All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're looking at uh, chapter five, section or key issue one and two for language here. And so you guys read this hopefully a long time ago. And so we're going to give you some of our information on it right now. So one of Mr. Sheridan's favorite slides here, looking at the language and the World Cup. What do you think about that? I think it's awesome. Yeah. Here we go. Good right? stuff. You guys ready to e learn? <laughs> let's do it. Right, let's take a look. Here's our first one that we look at. Uh, New York City Science, you can see we have three different languages on there. You've got English, you've got Mandarin, you've got Spanish on there. Again, lots of different languages in New York, right, when we look at that. And so when we look at the basics of language, that's where we're starting out here. 6,900 different languages spoken in the world, but only 11 of them are spoken by 100 million people or more. So that's a big, big aspect. We look at kind of 11 major languages here. Right, language is uh, obviously communication through speech. There's all kinds of different types. Uh, we look at writing as being included, but not all languages have a written component to them. There are many that do not. And a lot of times countries will designate an official language, but that's not always the case either. So if we take a look here, there are 7,102 living languages in the world. You see most of them coming out of Asia, a lot of them coming out of Africa. Um, and you can see kind of dwindling down here as we get into the Americas. Still a lot of them coming out of there. So lots and lots of different languages. Lots of indigenous, lots of folk languages here, right? Remember, 100 major or 100 million, there's only 11, right? These are going to be your major languages of the world. They're going to be a little different, right? They're going to operate a little differently. So here's our language families, and we're going to get way more into this. You can see all the different Colors here might be a little bit difficult to see, but you can see kind of what we're looking at. We've got Mandarin here as being your biggest one, but we'll get more into that. We'll look at all the different languages. It's a nice well. map in your book, too. Definitely. Here's what we're talking about. So you can see we've got the Indo, we're going to get into kind of language families. We've got the Indo-European language family here, the Sino-Tibetan language family. Those are obviously your two biggest ones. We'll get into some of the other ones as well. We'll start to look at kind of the language trees, as they call them, a little bit as well. Here's your top ten. All right, most common languages spoken in the world, 807, uh, 873, uh, when we look at in the number of, uh, what are we at, millions here. So we're looking at Chinese or Mandarin specifically. There's a couple different types of Chinese on here. You can see Wu Chinese is down here as well. Mandarin is the main form of Chinese language, followed by Spanish, followed by English. And this is the, the native speakers when we're looking at it. All right. So we can get into others as well as we go down the list here. Here's another kind of similar thing that we're looking at, 7.2 billion people on earth, it says on the, when they took this information. And again, the different dialects of Chinese, all of them together, make up about 1.39 billion people. When we look at that. Here's English at about 527 million. Right, think about colonialism here, right? Think about Islam, right? When it comes to Arabic, you got colonialism here, you got colonialism there, you got Russification over there, 254 million, right? French, you would think would be a dying language in this stage four country, but it is actually a language that is rising because of all the colonialism that the French did in Africa and rising populations. So that matters, right? Channel your inner two, your channel, channel two, or your chapter two population stuff. All right, so how is English diffused? We actually put another video on there if you want to take a look at the diffusion of English closer. You can do that as well, but we'll give you kind of the basics here. Today, English is actually the official language in 57 countries. That does not include the United States. We do not have an official language, right? So there are, uh, that is the first language of over 300 million people, and it's spoken, spoken fluently by over a billion people worldwide. And again, Mr. Sharon was just talking about the idea of migration, diffusion. It comes down to that, right? We talk about the idea of colonialization. People all across the world were speaking English because of the English, because of Great Britain. And this is relocation diffusion, right? Big ticket items of culture, language, religion, ethnicity. Those are all going to be relocation diffusion, right? Although you could argue that there's some hierarchical diffusion here as well because the uh, British are going to impose their will, right, on the colonists and make them speak their language. So you can see it comes through British imperialism. We talk about Afri uh, the American col colonies here, then later Ireland, South Asia, Africa, Oceania, and continue to spread to other places later by the United States, not just by Britain. Yeah. Please note that the United States also, right, uh, diffuses and imperializes, right? So the Philippines uh, it was a it was an American colony. Uh, Puerto Rico, right? All the indigenous people, right? They're going to be forced to speak English at that point, right? So a little bit of cultural genocide happening along here, too. 
So again, here's our English as an official or predominant language. So some of these are official languages. Some of our are places where English is the predominant language here. So you can see pretty much global. And that's what we talked about with the diffusion of, of the United Kingdom, diffusion of Great Britain, bringing that to all the colonies and other parts of the world here, and then the United States doing that as well. And so spoken across the globe. So if we look at where and how English actually originated, it is kind of a hodgepodge of a language. It starts out originally in England. It's uh, The inhabitants there are the people called the Celts. And over time, through different invasions from different groups of people from Europe, we see that English language is shaped pretty greatly here. So modern English evolved from the languages of the Germanic people, of the Angles, Jutes, and, Sa Jutes and Saxons, uh, Vikings, or the Danes eventually brought in their uh, linguistic influence as well around the 800s. And then the Normans from northern France invaded as well and brought in their uh, influence. And so English has become kind of this hodgepodge language over time, all kinds of different various influences, um, and still being influenced today, obviously, by America as well. And so you can see here all of our different invasions, different times here. And so again, how does how does uh, English how is English shaped? It's shaped through all the different invasions that are going on here at this time. And there's another little video clip you can check on about would we be able to understand the English language at, this, at different times in history. And if you can get to a certain point in history, and you would not be able to understand English anymore at that point. So what are the different dialects of English? We talk about dialects, regional variations, and this is some of the most uh, interesting stuff we get into. Even across the United States, we have a, obviously different dialects and, and different regional variations of our language, but we look at differences in spelling, vocabulary, and pronunciation. And so we talk about identifying the different word usage patterns, and we get to this idea of isogloss, or word usage boundaries. Where are we going to be using certain words in different places or regions? And so we look at, so a lot of times, some of these dialects will be, will be designated as standard languages for that area. English dialects exist in various countries, obviously, our, our English is different than the Great British Great Britain English or United Kingdom English. It's different in uh, different parts of England. It's different in India. It is different in Australia. So we see those changes all throughout the world. Wherever English is spoken, there's different dialects being spoken. Again, even in the U.S., we have different dialects as well that we're seeing. So you see this in, in British English. And we ourselves probably can't tell the difference between a Midlands accent and a Northern accent or a Geordie accent from, uh, from Newcastle, right? Or a London accent. We probably can't tell the difference because we don't listen to them enough, right? We don't hear the variations. But if you live in the UK, you can probably tell the difference. Make sense? Think about if you're talking about like a Northern accent in the United States versus a Southern accent, right? We don't we think do. we have an accent, but we do. Oh, we, we absolutely do. You betcha. You betcha. So here's a green slide for you. So we take a look, what is the standard language? And we just kind of talked a little bit about that. Uh, but again, it's a variant of a language that a country's political and intellectual elite are seeking to promote as the norm for use in schools and government and media. Um, and again, we see this throughout most, most countries. So in, uh, specifically like in I Ireland, we have Irish, the idea of Gaelic being important. Government employees must pass an exam in Gaelic so that they're able to, to be in the government essentially. Uh, we look at uh, the British receiving the pronunciation of what they call the King's English, which is the English language dialect that came from London, essentially. And then we look at, uh, obviously, Paris, the dialect from Paris being the main one in France, and Beijing in China, and so on. Uh, so you can see, again, that happens pretty commonly. We see kind of a standard language, uh, for that standard dialect, I should say. And that language. type is going to get imposed on, on other people, right? So, you know, it's not just lower class, like a Cockney accent, like the Beatles had. Versus the Queen's English, how the Queen speaks is going to be very different than, than how a, a kind of a working class person in, in Britain is going to speak. But these ideas, they take on political power, right? And how you pronounce things right, is, is a reflection of where you come from and, and who you are. Exactly. Mr. Chair, you want to grab this one? Yeah. So we got, uh, again, uh, British English being different than American English, right? We got, uh, in, in terms of dialect, we got three important things. We got vocabulary. Right? We've got spelling and we've got pronunciation, like an accent. Right? Vocabulary, again, you're going to look at, at things being uh, different. So channel your, your Harry Potter, channel wherever, wherever you listen to a British accent, and they will use different words. Right? So they'll use, instead of a garbage can, it's called a rubbish bin, something along those lines. Right? A uh, truck is called a lorry. Right? There's a lot of different examples, and you can have a lot of fun 
um, thinking about that, right? So vocabulary is going to be different. Also, keep in mind that new, there's new words. Uh, when the, when the Brits show up in the in the new world, there's new things, right? And so we're always expanding those things. Um, moose, right? Uh, had to be a word that was in, invented uh, in, in the United States because there aren't moose in uh, in the UK, right? Spelling uh, is our, our second way that we look at it, and this is where we get into Noah Webster. You may have heard of him; he's kind of a big deal. Kind of invented a dictionary, but he invented a dictionary that was an American-based dictionary, and he took out all the different uh, spellings, and he made made an American dialect in terms of spelling. So you see the the O U R, right? Uh, as an example, um, there's plenty of different things that you'll see, right? And then pronunciation is, is kind of our most obvious one, right? And again, that changes as a result of uh, isolation. The further away you get from where your uh, your language is, its hearth is, the more likely it is to change, right? We use isolation, we look at convergence and divergence, right, when it comes to languages. And we'll talk about convergence a little later, but divergence is pretty important, right? when they diverge, when they change, when they shift. Just a number of examples here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Petrol and gas, lorry and truck. And this is just for cars alone, right? This is just automobile driven. So that's kind of fun. Take a look at it when you get a chance, right? That's all going to be on our website. Yep. Oh, Baby Yoda just Baby spelled. Yoda just spelled. Oh, no. <laughs> Poor guy. Child. The, child the child is back, back right? Is back. <laughs> <laughs> right. So again, we look at dialects and, and how they uh, exist uh, in the United States, right? Again, we look at uh, you know settlement patterns, right? This is this is migration as it is, right? So you get uh, you know New England uh, being primarily English, and this is the one that's going to be closest to British English is going to be the New England accent, right? It's going to have the clipped. Uh, tones, right? The mid-Atlantic, you're going to see uh, various other people coming through, German, Swedes, and Irish, for example, and that gives you uh, more diversity in its uh, in its approach, right? And then the southeastern, you're going to get a lot of lower class uh, Irish, right, and a low, and lower class English in the south southeastern, and so those uh, poor um, people are going to have different accents than the than the the, the British perceived uh, English. And so that's going to form the, the southern accent from there, right? Again, modern American dialects, uh, you're going to see most, most noticeable in the east, right? Um, and, and the south as well, right? The south is going to put, right? That's cut off, right? Uh, Western settlers are going to be kind of, kind of from the mid-Atlantic, and they're going to, it's going to get smoothed out, right, the further out you get. So there's, you're less likely to pick up on a California accent uh, than you are on a Georgia accent, for example. There's a really good video, too, of the Mental Floss video that we loaded up there for you. It, it talks about all the differences between all the different dialects in the United States, too. Things from, uh, is, it a, is it a rain shower, or is it a sun shower, or is it the devil's beating your wife, or things right. that are super regional that we may not even be familiar with. Yeah. So check that out. A crawler versus a donut, right? Things exactly. like that. So here's what we look at when we talk about where everything's kind of located here. And the interesting thing is it kind of works its way across the country. Right? So people from kind of New England are going to have, we'll see kind of people towards the kind of eastern Wisconsin will have similar dialect ideas or similar dialect options here when we talk about their language to people of the northeast as well. And so we'll, we'll show you that map here. Here it is. So you can see it kind of works its way across the country here, each of these areas. So you can see kind of what each area is kind of based on. And then the West is kind of all on its own, developed differently over time. Maybe one of my favorite maps right here. You guys know it's up on the wall over here in class as well, those of you who have been in here. Um, this one is a, always a hot contested uh, thing in my house because my wife, Mrs. Starr, is from just north of Milwaukee. And so whenever we talk about pop, she always says it's soda, right? She's right. Yeah, exactly. So it's soda. soda I said, hey, we are in Minnesota, so it is pop in Minnesota. And if you take a look, I would say, I don't know about you, Mr. Chairman, but I, it looks to me like a majority of the country, with the exception of the southern portion, yeah, has we're not taking in population in consideration, right? Well, Keep in mind that, yes, 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 that, yes, it's dominated in Wyoming, yeah. but there's nobody in Wyoming, right? Whereas all those soda folks are on that east coast, right? Yes. And on the west coast, so... You know, maybe Miss Star is on to something. Something to be aware of if you are going on a vacation or a trip. I was in Florida at one point uh, on vacation. I asked for an orange pop, and guess what I got? Coke. I did not. <laughs> I got an orange juice. And uh -huh. like, oh, no, just, <laughs> so they had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, here's another really, really good one, I think. Uh, the duck, duck, gray duck. We are literally the only state in the entire country that calls it duck, duck, gray duck. All right, when we look at it. So we're the only ones that are right. Exactly, exactly. Again, another hot contested thing in my, my household. My wife always says, what is a gray duck? And I say, it's a goose. That's what it is. But it's a gray duck for us. Uh, we'll come back to those. We might, we might throw those links on for you. We'll talk about them. There's the mental floss Mr. Star referenced. Yeah, we'll maybe give you a heat map survey on there too so you can see where your language dialect is from. Kind of a funny one. So it says, if the GH sound in enough is pronounced F and on, and the O in woman uh, is pronounced with the short I sound and the TI in nation is pronounced SH, then the word, right, that word is pronounced just like fish. Right. Welcome to the English language. Again, this speaks to the diversity of, of the influences right, and how messed up English is, and it makes it incredibly hard to learn. It's one of the toughest languages to learn if you're a non-native speaker. Right? So most of us are, are native speakers in this class, and we've dr you know, drawn a long straw in, on some levels. Right? It's, a, it's a big language in the world. So when we look at why is language related to other languages, we're going to get more into the, the relation of languages here. We talk about the language family language branch. And so when we look at language family, it's something that's related through a common ancient ancestral language. We look at language branch. Ancient. In state, yes, ancient. When we look at a language branch, it's related more through recent ancestral languages. And so here's what we have here. If you take a look, English is right here. So English is in the Germanic family here. It is in the West branch. And here is English right here. So we look at the Indo European. I'm sorry, Indo European family. Yeah, Indo-European family is, is important. Again, it goes way, way, way back, right? Now, keep in mind that it's not like the Germanic branch. If you look at the Germanic branch and you start looking at, at where we are, right, we cannot really, right, if you heard Frisian, you wouldn't be able to tell what it is, right? Um, that, uh, yes, it's a more recent ancestral language, but it's, that doesn't mean that we have a whole lot in common. No, there is not. And so here is the language trees that we were talking about. Here is the Indo-European tree that we were kind of talking about, the, the largest of all the languages here. Uh, we have the, uh, you can see different, multiple trees here with different aspects or different types of uh, language here as well. All right, so again, if we look up here, here's English. Right? You can see some of the other leaves that are closer to us are the other languages. So you've got the Romance languages over here, Spanish, Portuguese, French, Italian. We'll get to sign up Tibetan. It's not on there. Yeah, the sign up Tibetan side. I think yeah. is on the next one. So again, we're going to focus on the Indo-European Indo uh, family. Do you have to know all of these? No, you do not, right? You do not have to know, but you should know Indo-European branches, right? So there's the Indo-Iranian, which has Hindi, right, and Bengali. So you're going to see that in South Asia. Uh, you have the Balto-Slavic, right? And if you hear the word Slavic, you, you need to think uh, Eastern European. So this is going to have Russian and Czech and, and uh Yugoslavian uh, languages. And then you have the Romance language, which is pretty important, right? Comes from Rome, Romance Rome, right? These are all at one point Latin, right? And they became, right, they, they were regional dialects of Latin, right? So Spain, right, uh, you see it was in, in a um, Iberian Peninsula, right? And French was in, uh, was in the Gaul region, which is now modern day France. Right? And Italian was a little closer to, you know, it was, it was in, you know, it was the, the hearth of, of, the, of the, um, the Roman Empire. But eventually, when, when, when Rome falls, these languages diverge, right? And they become something that used to be a regional language, a regional pattern, a dialect of Latin. And they become their own separate language through time and isolation. Remember, isolation is incredibly important, right? Languages will diverge if they are isolated. A lot of times we look at this too, we can tell they're related because if you're speaking Spanish, if you have Spanish right now, and you go to an Italian restaurant, you can probably tell what some of the words are on that. On Particularly the if you read the menu. Exactly. Right? But the difference would be, you know, the, the pronunciation is going to be different, but you can see a lot of, of the same um, you know, patterns uh, Definitely. written. Definitely. So there we are. There they all are when we look at the Indo European branches here. So all of them here, again, we've got the Balto Slavic in here, we've got your uh, romance, which actually Romania falls in there as well for the Romance language, uh, kind of separated from the others. We can see then your Germanic languages in here as well. There's 
little bit closer look at those Romance languages specifically. And again, it all starts as Latin in the Roman Empire here in Rome and over time spreads out. And because of isolation, like Mr. Sheridan said, it develops differently over time. All right, we're going to see that that's pretty, a pretty common thread. Note Catalan when we start talking about that. Uh oh, oh, what happened? Ah, we're All right, maybe we're back. Where are we? I think we're back. We're back. All right. <laughs> so, like Mr. Sheridan said, watch for uh, Catalan here, watch for Andorra when we start talking about like political geography, ethnic geography, mm -hmm. all those things. Yeah. It's a cultural fact, right? Language will split a country. For sure. Right? All right, time to talk about Proto Indo European, right? Uh, we look at where did Indo-European languages originate, how did it spread. Um, so we have, we don't really know, right? This is this is prehistory. This is um, you know ancient stuff. So linguists uh, are doing the best they can to try to figure out where this came. But we, at one point, uh, there was a Proto-Indo-European language where everybody spoke roughly the same language, and there was variations. You know, of course, there's going to be dialect, but but that, right? So they go back and they they tra trace words, common words like winter, snow, bear, deer, and oak. They all have all of that, right? And so there's two ways to look at that, right? There's two ways uh, to um, that people think how language spread this Proto-Indo-European language, right? First one is the, the nomadic warrior thesis, right? And that's hearth is going to be in Central Asia, and it's spread by Kurgan warriors, and they conquer uh, on horseback, and they bring their language with them, and they impose it uh, on them, and that's how Proto-Indo-European get spread. That's one theory, right? Theory number two is the sedentary farmer thesis, right? And this is an Anatolia, the ant, sometimes called the Anatolian heart theory as well. Anatolia is modern day Turkey. It's that, it's that landmass kind of in, in Eurasia, kind of that central spot where Turkey is, right? And the sedentary farmer thesis said that language is not spread through the warrior, through the horse, but it was instead spread through agricultural practices. That good agricultural practices got spread throughout by the sedentary farmers, right? Who did that? Do we know? No, right. but there are theories, right? So there you have it. Green slide for you. When we look at language formation, it's kind of going back to the same thing we we're just talking about: the idea that linguists look at similarities in particular words over time in the languages and how the sounds kind of shift in those. Um, and so the, we can look at some of the good examples of that. Maybe the best one here is in the German language. Uh, we look at Bader. Uh, eventually becomes Dutch, Vader, and English eventually becomes father. All right, so over time you can see that the sounds, the syllables, and the sounds kind of uh, soften a little bit from where they had been at one point. All right, and so we talk about the, the grims, the fairy tales, uh, and the idea that things become softer over time when we look at the... So these folks didn't just make creepy fairy tales, right? They also studied the language and... Exactly. They, they look at comments becoming soft, right? So a T becomes a D, which eventually becomes a T, which is a th, right? Which is a lighter sound than a T, right? Harder, that's a harder sound. When we talked about the Romance languages mm -hmm. earlier, milk in Romance languages, it's uh, latte or lata or late or leche. Mm -hmm. So again, similarities here when we talk about the words. And that sound shifts, so understand that. Okay. This is how we study ancient language. Here's both of those theories we're talking about. You've got the Kurgan heart here. Again, spread, uh, spread through the warriors here, spread through the sword, essentially, and the horse. Uh, and then we've got the sedentary farmer thesis here. And that's totally yeah, right. present-day Turkey. <laughs> Another green slide for you, Mr. Sheridan. You want that one? Uh, again, this is just the convergence di uh, and divergence. So we've talked a little bit about that. We mentioned it earlier. Right? Convergence is the collapsing of two languages in is into one because they, they come uh, together. Right? You see this in Malta. English and Maltese are, are currently being mixed, right? We'll talk a little bit about that with creolized religions in, in 5.3, 5.4, right? And then we also have divergence, right? It's when a new language is formed due to spatial interaction. So what become, what was a regional dialect uh, eventually becomes so far removed over time and isolation that it becomes a separate language. And we can look at Romance languages being a good example of that. Uh, Portuguese diverging, diverting from from Spanish, right? Because they have to travel over the mountains, right? To, and so there's there's isolation on the Iberian Peninsula, right? Again, this isn't anything. These aren't things that happen overnight. These are things that take a long, 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 long time, right? Language patterns, it takes a while to shift. 
Uh, again, we look at dialects of Spain, we see convergence and dialect convergence there. Again, we look at Catalan being um, a, a major central point here, right, and a cultural factor when it comes to the politics, when it comes to the economics, when it comes to the nationalism of Spain, right? At some point in your life, you may see a separate country here. I right? would say for sure. Yeah. 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 Well, we'll talk about that in our next unit. The Barcelona colors, right? The Barcelona soccer team has, it's, it's done in the Catalan flag, right? and not the Spanish flag. Again, you look at same language thing. diversion, right. kind of the same way, right? A bit of divergence there. Back to those uh, that language tree, and and, uh, and so I would make sure you kind of look that over. I would know the, the basic idea of the, the the families and the groups. Here's what you got. At. You got to know this stuff. You should know Indo-European. You should know Sino-Tibetan only because many many people speak it, right? Sure. Because you have Mandarin and you have have uh, the, the Chinese dialects or uh, languages in there, right? Do you have to know this one or that one or that one? No, I don't think you do, right? I'm pretty sure, right? We'll talk a, a, a few funky ones in terms of Uralic or uh, Basque or something along those lines. There'll be some exceptions to that, but generally speaking, you should understand the different right, kind of being. Uh, you'll get most of the languages, the big languages of the world, right here in these two families. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is it. Hopefully you enjoyed our first of our... Uh, distance learning recordings here for you. Uh, we will try to keep them short as, as possible. This is really interesting stuff. I, don't, I, I think the language stuff is some I of love the best stuff we yeah. do. So unfortunately, you can't be here to do it, so hopefully you have the chance to, to look at some of those videos that we put on there for you as well. Um, but we'll try to keep them shorter. If you don't like this format, please let us know, guys. If you don't want us in the picture, tell us so that we can do it a little bit differently next time. Maybe. Right? Yep. Yeah. We'll, we'll try to wear costumes too. We'll, we'll try to come and we'll spice it up. have a little yeah. bit of flair, right? Not just Baby Yoga and Captain America rock t-shirts. So. All right. Till next time, guys.